This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Leon Dash, CAS Professor of Journalism and Director of the Center for Advanced Study. I am delighted to welcome you all to tonight's annual lecture, one of the Center's most important annual events. For over 20 years, the Center has showcased the work of a CAS professor in this annual lecture. The accomplishments of CAS faculty, past and present, are considerable. Appointment to a CAS professorship is considered to be one of the highest honors that the university can bestow upon a faculty member at the Urbana-Champaign campus. Jean Robinson, CAS professor of entomology, was appointed to the center in 2009, and he is one of 27 current CAS professors. He will deliver tonight's talk, Me to We, Searching for the Genetic Roots of Sociality. I should mention that the, actual, the, at the annual lecture is usually the big kickoff event in the fall. But because Gene is in such high demand <laughs> on campus and off, this was the earliest date we could secure on his calendar. <laughs> and that's with arm twisting. I would like to say a few words about the Center for Advanced Study, a small unit with a big impact on this campus. Our programs are designed to support the mission of the center, which is to identify and promote the best scholarly and creative work by faculty from all parts of our university. Uh, before I forget, I'd like to welcome Richard Wheeler, our vice president of the university here this evening. Good evening, Dick. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Of particular importance to the faculty on our campus is the Center for Advanced Study Associates and Fellows Program, granting one semester of release time away from the classroom to devote to research. I, and law, along with all the other center professors, meet annually to review all of the applications from departments across campus and select the most outstanding proposals. On behalf of the CAS professors, let me take this moment to acknowledge the Office of the Provost, and the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research, whose support enabled us to appoint 25 associates and fellows this year. These newest CAS appointments are listed on our website. The center coordinates or partic participates in many of the interdisciplinary intellectual activities on campus, including the CAS annual initiative. This year, the initiative is Cultures of Law in Global Context. CS resident associate Xiao Dan, Faisal Mohammed, Siobhan Somerville lead this initiative. We also produce the prestigious CAS Millicom series of public events as well as talks highlighting the current research of our faculty across campus. A reminder for everyone, the next deadline is March 11 if you are interested in bringing in a high profile speaker to campus. Finally, I would like to thank my staff at the Center for Advanced Study, Masumi Iriye, Liselle Wilhagen, Cheryl Reeder, and Candace Custer. It is my distinct pleasure now to welcome to the podium CAS Professor of Entomology, May Berenbaum, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. So yesterday I, I was having breakfast with Jean and I said, should I give a sort of short dry introduction or maybe review 5,000 years of the study of social insects? And he said, um, yeah, you could do 5,000 years in five minutes. And it was only this morning when I mentioned this to my husband, he said, I think Jean was joking. <laughs> he said you could do it, but not that you should do it. But I'm going to do it. So, <laughs> so uh, 
The social insects, bees, ants, wasps, termites, and their ilk, have long attracted attention not only because they're the most abundant animals on the planet, but because they appear to embody so many virtues people uh, hold dear. Group effort, self-sacrifice, devotion to youth, and so on. So there's been a long-standing conviction that we ought to learn from them. Exactly what has, uh, should be learned has varied over the millennia, but that we should learn from them is literally a biblical imperative. Proverbs chapter 6, lines 6 through 8, observe, Go to the ant, consider her ways, and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. Famed Greek philosopher Aristotle in his Historia Animalium from 350 BC singled out for recognition not just humans but bees and other what he called uh, zoa politica, social animals, those whose function becomes some one common theme which not all the gregarious animals do. Such are the human being, the bee, the wasp, the ant, and the crane. Rarified company, although I'm not sure how the crane got in there. Virgil, Roman poet of the first century BC, waxed eloquent that the bees at nature's command practice common life in society and observe a marvelous order among themselves. The lesser known Bartholomaeus Anglicus, a 13th century monk and scholar in his De Proprietatibus Rerum, book 12, wrote, the properties of bees are wonderful, noble, and worthy, for bees have one common kind as children and dwell in one habitation, are closed within one gate, one travail is common to them all, one meat is common to them all, one common working, one common use, one fruit and flight common to them all, one generation is common to them all. Also, maidenhood of body without whim or moral stain is common to them all, and so is birth also. It goes on at length uh, about uh, virtue and lechery, but uh, in the interest of time, through the Renaissance, bees were used by poets, politicians, and saints as symbols of industry, creativity, governance, and chastity, the latter by virtue of a fundamental misunderstanding of their mating behavior, but that's for another lecture. <laughs> by the 19th century, scientists were as intrigued by the distinctive behavior of social insects as were the poets and philosophers. In 1859, Charles Darwin, in his book Origin of Species, mentioned the social insects as one of the, quote, special difficulties of the theory of natural selection and devoted most, most of chapter seven uh, to objections to the theory of natural selection as applied to neuter and sterile insects. I've now explained how, as I believe, the wonderful fact of two distinctly defined casts of sterile workers existing in the same nest, both widely different from each other and from their parents, has originated. We can see how useful their production may have been to a social community of ants on the same principle that the division of labor is useful to civilized man. Ants, however, work by inherited instinct, by inherited organs or tools, whilst man works by acquired knowledge and manufactured instruments. But I must confess, with all my faith in natural selection, I should never have anticipated that that this principle could have been efficient in so high a degree had not the case of the neuter insects led me to this conclusion. This is by far the most serious special difficulty which my theory has encountered. Even in modern times, how social insects can act so much like people and so little like the bulk of their insect relatives has remained mystifying. Harvard professor and ant expert E.O. Wilson in 1871 remarked, the reconstruction of mass behavior from a knowledge of the behavior of single colony members is the central problem of insect sociology. Enter Jean Robinson, who has been steadily one-upping Aristotle, Virgin, Darwin, and Wilson in making quantum advances forward toward a, de a definitive answer to this venerable question. He's managed this feat by combining thorough knowledge of and deep affection for one organism, Apis mellifera, the western honeybee, with a keen appreciation of natural history, relentless ingenuity in designing experiments, and an inexhaustible capacity for applying new technologies to hitherto intractable research questions. No time here for a story of his life, just to say his interest in bees began in Israel on a kibbutz, appropriately an experimental form of human social living, through Cornell for three degrees in bee biology, intermittent uh, working as a beekeeper, postdoctoral stints here and abroad, finally the University of Illinois in 18, 1989. With laser-like precision, Gene has pursued twin lines of investigation in genetics and physiology of bees, and his work at both the colony and individual level span a breadth of of investigation of social behavior unparalleled by any other investigator working today. 
enthusiastically embracing genomics and all that it offers for solving scientific questions, he is a, now a leading figure among genome scientists writ broad. He is the principal architect of the Honeybee Genome Sequencing Initiative uh, and was the preeminent spokesperson and coordinator for this massive research enterprise encompassing over 60 scientists on at least four continents. Almost single-handedly, he turned Apis mellifera into a modern model organism for understanding all those traits we thought made us human coining the term sociogenomics to describe the study of the genetic architecture of social animals to characterize the mecha mechanistic underpinnings of the behavior that seems so human to us. Thanks to Gene and the explosion of gen genome-enabled research that he facilitated, we now know that social interactions can profoundly influence gene expression with remarkable speed and scope, and many of our behavioral quirks, including novelty-seeking, addiction, and aggression, may be hardwired wired into our sociable genomes. Along the way, Gene has published more papers in Nature Science and PNAS, PNAS than most entire departments and has brought over $40 million in funding for the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, I think three different institutes within NIH, USDA, and a slew of private foundations. He is exceptionally talented in bringing teams of people together, tapping and integrating their diverse interests and skills to cooperatively undertake groundbreaking enterprises. His research collaborations span the globe, and with this network, he has published over 250 papers, collectively cited in the literature over 7,000 times. Even as the research efforts has grown, Gene's leadership role in the scientific community has expanded as well. Beyond the standard service to professional societies and editorial boards, he's helped launch an initiative, I5K, a coordinated plan to sequence 5,000 insect genomes in five years. He's assumed personal responsibility for 15 additional bee genomes. Uh, they're being sequenced right now in order to shed light on how social behavior evolves. He sits on scientific advisory boards for research institutes in three countries. He is, and as you heard, he's enormously popular as a speaker. It's really hard to get on his schedule. Uh, the University of Illinois is unquestionably the greatest beneficiary of Gene's vision, energy, and expertise. Um, he has, uh, we're exceptionally fortunate that he serves as director of the Institute for Genomic Biology, a key facility for the future of our campus. He's indispensable as a member of the Council of Center Directors, the Chancellor's Leadership Council, and the College of Business Entrepreneur Advisory Board. He's also, one thing I'm very grateful for, in his third decade as director of the University of Illinois Bee Research Facility, which he gener generously, might, might say, altruistically and enthusiastically shares with his colleagues and his community, enabling all kinds of bee research for anyone who's interested in, and um, providing guidance for those of us who come to bees late in life. Uh, we didn't see the way. Uh, moreover, he remains dedicated to teaching despite the demands of his extensive research and administrative portfolio. Just last fall, he made the list of teachers rated uh, excellent uh, by their students for his discovery course in genes and behavior. An exceptionally successful teacher and mentor, he supervised research of over 100 undergraduates and his three dozen plus graduate students in three different graduate programs have won multiple national awards. The scientific community has recognized Gene's contributions with many prestigious awards, including a Fulbright Scholarship, Guggenheim Fellowship, NIH Pioneer Award. He's been elected as a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the Animal Behavior Society, a fellow of the Entomological Society. On campus, he was designated a university scholar, a Swanland Chair, and as you heard, a member of the Center for Advanced Study. So what can you say about a guy who's improved on Darwin and Wilson? Well, I'll let, I'll let Sir Francis Bacon, the 17th century father of empirical science, have the last word in his uh, aphorism, uh, first book of aphorisms, Aphorism 95. He writes, the men of experiment are like the ant. They only collect and use, but the bee gathers its material from the flowers of the garden and of the field, but transforms and digests it by a power of its own. Gene is indeed a man of experiment, but he's no ant. He is definitely uh, a bee, gathering data and transforming our understanding of social bi biology and sharing it with you today. I expect he wouldn't want his metaphors any other way. Uh, it's an incredible pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Gene Robinson. Wow. 
the great thing about having May introduce you is that you uh, feel like a million bucks, but then you don't have very much time left for the, <laughs> for the lecture. But, uh, but, but I'll take that trade off any day. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really uh, delighted to be here, and it's great to see so many dear friends and uh, colleagues and students. I'd like to extend a special welcome to members of the Champaign-Urbana community. Thanks for coming out. And uh, we're, if you look around, we're just completely packed, so I'm just, uh, I'm just thrilled and honored, and I wonder maybe we're all sick of the luge by now? Is that what's... <laughs> I don't, don't know. So uh, I think we can all agree that um, social evolution has had some extraordinary effects on the planet giving rise to some extraordinary traits, language, agriculture, and warfare, traits that uh, have literally changed the face of the planet. What might be a little less known is that uh, we have examples of all of these traits uh, within the insect societies. We have, as an example, uh, symbolic language, the honeybee, which we'll feature in tonight's talk. Uh, agriculture, thought that the, this uh, leafcutter ant made famous by uh, Edward Wilson, may have mentioned him from, from Harvard University. Uh, leafcutter ants may be uh, some of the oldest farmers on the planet. They have fertilizer, they have pesticides. Uh, no one has yet found little John Deere tractors, but uh, <laughs> they are looking for them. These are bona fide farmers. And then warfare. Um, these are desert ants um, that actually engage in tournaments. This is work uh, that has been uh, brought to light by Bert Holdobler, first at Harvard University, now at Arizona State University. And these ants are actually engaged in tournaments. Individuals from different colonies will go to these places in the environment. It's not clear why they go there, but they go there, and they kind of check each other out. And uh, what happens is the ants that are smaller go back to their nest and batten down the hatches and get ready to be attacked, whereas the ants that are bigger go back to the colony and motivate the rest of the colony, arouse them to go out and attack the smaller colony. So clearly a case of, of warfare. So we have these examples in the insect societies. Of course, we have them in human societies. And then this raises um, a really profound question. Extreme sociality, extreme societies, are very rare in nature. What you see here is a diagram, basically a genealogy, but over deep evolutionary time, hundreds of millions of years, and uh, showing the evolutionary relationships between the various animal groups. And so you see over here that uh, some societies have evolved in the arthropods, uh, especially the insect societies, the ants, bees, termites, and wasps. And then, of course, our own society and our cousins on this side. What's interesting about this, and a really vexing problem, is that the last common ancestor looked something like this. It lived 600 million years ago. It's a marine flatworm. Um, it uh, has a very simple nervous system, no brain to speak of, very distributed nervous system. As far as we know, no social life, and uh, yet gave rise in this very uh, diffuse way to these insect societies and the human societies. Um, this then raises questions. How do animal societies evolve? How are they governed? These are the questions that I'm going to be addressing tonight. Indeed, that uh, research program in my laboratory has been devoted to for the past 25 years here at the University of Illinois. And I'm going to uh, talk about research that has uh, allowed me to say tonight that we have two main lessons so far that we've learned about the evolution of society uh, at the genetic level. And that is, first of all, that genes that influence social behavior have their evolutionary roots in solitary behavior. So I'm calling these colloquially me-to-we genes. And then secondly, that social behavior arises from a dynamic genome, from a genome that's responsive to the environment. So I'll go through several studies that we've done over the years to illustrate these points. But first, a little bit of background. I need to tell you a little bit about the Honeybee Society and also a little bit about genes, brains, and behavior before we go on. So, um, in terms of the honeybee society, so extreme society, there's a technical term for that, and that's eusociality. There are three traits that define eusociality or true sociality. First of all, an overlap of adult generations. And let me pause on that one for a second to kind of embellish from the perspective of insects. You might say, big deal, overlapping adult generations. Well, in insects, that really is a big deal, because most insects lay an egg and then pretty much soon after that will die. Or they may 
lay thousands of eggs, but they're engaged in that activity to provide little or no care at all. And then those, little, those eggs hatch into larvae, and they have to make their own way in the cruel world. No care at all. So the idea of having overlapping adult generations is really a big deal and is a key adaptation for enabling the societies, to, the individuals to be bound together in a society. Secondly, there is an extreme division of labor in the insect society. And here's where we get the word eusociality, um, where it even goes beyond the human society, where we have a very strict division of labor for reproduction. Some individuals reproduce and some don't. So the individual you see here in the center, by the way, they don't come painted, we have to do that. This is the queen and these are the worker bees. The worker bees engage in all the activities uh, involved in uh, the, the colony growth and development uh, at the colony level and then the queen's job is to lay eggs. The queen, I should add, and it's important to, uh, to some of the topics that I'll cover later, the queen was named at a time, you heard a, an incredibly uh, broad sweep of history a few minutes ago, the queen was named at a time in our human history when we were rather enamored of royalty. Uh, it, and if she were named today, certainly if she were named by uh, my very irreverent 21-year-old son, um, probably should get nothing more than, yo, mama, egg-laying mama. <laughs> And uh, truth be told, that's really all she deserves because she doesn't tell the other individuals what to do, unlike we think a, a monarch um, did, at least originally. She does set an important tone in the colony. Uh, she has chemicals that modulate the general activity of all the individuals in the colony, but she doesn't tell anyone what to do. That's going to feature prominently in a story later on in the talk. For now, just want to highlight, queens reproduce, the workers don't. And then finally, the third attribute, that there's cooperative brood care. Some individuals are caring for their younger sisters. Uh, they're caring for the queen, their queen mother's daughters, and they're working at this job together. So these then attributes define eusociality. Just to fill out the B roster, this is a picture of a male. The workers are female, the queen of course is female. This is a male. Sorry guys, if you look up drone in Webster's Dictionary, it means lazy. As far as we know, drones perform no labor in the colony, no useful functions except for mating with the virgin queens. So they're not going to feature in the stories tonight. So, in addition to uh, the division of labor over reproduction, there's a division of labor among the workers, as this picture evokes. Uh, adult worker honeybees live about six weeks. They spend the first two and a half to three weeks working in the hive, and then they kind of graduate and from here, and then they become a forager. So this process is a process of behavioral maturation at the individual level, and then at the colony level, it gives rise to this profound division of labor, which helps the bees uh, achieve so much of what they are able to do. So that's a little introduction into bee biology, and now I just want to cover a couple of concepts from the perspective of genes, brains, and behavior, um, and then we will move on. So, first of all, we'll be talking a lot about genes tonight, and uh, so it's important to just put this into context. So, genes are DNA. The DNA is transcribed into a substance called RNA. The RNA then is translated into protein. Proteins are the business molecules of all organisms. In the case of what we'll be talking about tonight, they build the brain, they function the, the brain, they maintain the brain, they rejuvenate the brain. Um, all aspects of function have to do, are based on proteins proteins, and they start from, from the genes. So we're talking about uh, genomic studies, so it's fair to ask, well, what's a genome? And uh, that's important just to keep in mind. So a genome is a long piece of DNA. It's found in all cells, and it's composed of a variety of components. One, of course, all the genes. Secondly, are other pieces of DNA that regulate the genes. And one of my take-home messages is that the regulation of genes is emerging as a really, really important factor in understanding sociality. So it's these small pieces of genes, uh, small pieces of DNA that are in the front of the genes that are not the pro that actually make the proteins that are becoming increasingly important. Then there are also relics of genes that are no longer functional. And that evokes a second aspect of the, of the function of the genome. The first function I alluded to, um, genes make everything in the body. And so ge the genome can be seen as sort of an instruction manual. 
but in addition to that, they are a history book. They, are, they record the history of species and changes that occur to species that lead to changes in the structure of a gene, of many genes, and then therefore the function of those genes. So the genome kind of has, has two personalities, as an instruction manual and as a history book. Tonight we'll primarily be looking at it as an instruction manual, talking about genes, a little bit about what the genes do. Um, but there will be times when I will also be able to evoke um, the history book concept as well. So now we've talked about genes, DNA, genomes. <clears throat> I want to embed that in the brain and also plant the seed of a uh, challenge, an, an unrealized challenge um, for the work that I'll be talking about that needs to be addressed as we go forward. And that is uh, seen here. So we've talked about DNA, talked about D uh, RNA. Um, when the DNA is transcribed, um, that's called gene expression. Gene expression has to do with the abundance of RNA. So if a gene is very active, it's producing a lot of RNA. If it's less active, less uh, RNA. So we talked about DNA, RNA, protein. What I want to call your attention to is the span between DNA and behavior. Behavior is one of the phenotypes or one of the sets of traits furthest away from the DNA. To get from DNA to behavior, you have to go through the brain. And you have to go through multiple layers. The brain is incredibly complicated. It involves neurons, so individual cells. These cells are integrated to, fo to form circuits. The circuits are integrated into forming regions of the brain with functional specializations. And then together the brain functions um, to produce behavior. And so we're talking about gene expression way over here, and as I will show you tonight, influencing in very strong ways behavior. And uh, a really pressing challenge we have is how is it that changes in RNA abundance are able to lead to changes in protein that then work their way through the very many levels of the brain uh, to be able to change behavior. Okay, so with that as background, I'm going to be talking about two lessons. The first one is that genes that influence social behavior have evolutionary roots in solitary behavior. I'll tell you two stories that illustrate this. First, um, uh, I'll talk about some genes that we studied, first uh, based on what they did in what they're known to do in solitary insects, uh, have being involved in feeding-related behaviors, and we found that they're involved in influencing the division of labor in honeybees. Then I'll talk about a brain chemical um, that's uh, also involved in feeding, but from a slightly different perspective, um, that's involved in the dance language of the honeybee. So the first gene that we studied that we were able to implicate in the regulation of division of labor, and I'll remind you that's this maturation from working in the hive to becoming a forager, uh, was a gene that was known in fruit flies, in Drosophila, that powerhouse of genetics um, in, in biology. This was a gene that was discovered by my colleague Marla Sokolowski at the University of Toronto. And uh, Marla's lab studied a particular behavioral variation in flies. She found that some flies, this is the picture over here, these are the larval flies, some larval flies, um, or maggots as they are also known, if you put them on a food medium, they will travel uh, just a, a little bit here. So let's see if I can show this a little better right there. You see they've traveled just a little bit on the medium, whereas this individual is traveling quite a bit further. Uh, the Sokolowski lab did a lot of experiments to show this is a genetic variation, that it is inherited. In other words, it's inherited. So if you uh, were like this when you were young, when you grew up and had babies, your babies would be like this. So she enabled these sitters and rovers. The rovers moved around a lot more than the sitters. Um, in the early 2000s, this was before we were able to sequence the honeybee genome, and so therefore had very little in the way of reagents uh, to work with. We didn't have the catalog of genes where we can sit back and pick and choose what genes we might want to study. Um, we had to pay attention to what was going on in fruit flies. We saw this gene. And uh, my graduate student at the time, Yehuda Ben Shahar, who got his PhD from the entomology department, now he's on the faculty at Washington State Univer Washington University in St. Louis. I had two kids graduated from WashU. You'd think I know their name after writing checks for eight years. So. <laughs> The, fr the fruit fly gene was very interesting here, this foraging gene, because it had a behavioral polymorphism, that is the sitting and roving, and uh, intriguingly, the difference was attributed to differences in gene expression. Not the structure of the protein that's produced from the gene, therefore not the sequence of the gene, but the expression of the gene. 
Rovers had low levels of expression of the gene, uh, excuse me, sitters had low levels of expression of the gene, and rovers had high levels of expression. So Yuda and I were quite intrigued about this because, uh, after all, it's possible to look at division of labor kind of in this way. So bees working in the hive are staying home. They're pretty much all day at home. And then they become foragers after a few weeks. And then they're outside a lot. You see them on the flowers, and they make trips back and forth. Um, and so they're quite active. So we wondered whether this polymorphism in flies, which is genetic, that is inherited, could somehow be transposed to a different time scale and work in real time during the maturation of bees from working in the hive to becoming a forager. So we hypothesized that honeybee foragers are like rovers, so therefore they should have higher levels of expression of this gene in the brain, and that's what we found. The foraging gene is higher in the brains of rover flies and forager bees. This is what Yuta found. So that's a nice uh, intriguing correlation. But in flies, you can do the genetic manipulations to show this is causal. You can take a sitter and genetically engineer it to have the rover version of the gene and turn it into a rover. So we did something analogous to that, and that is we manipulated the gene pathway so that it would be more active in young bees. And sure enough, we were able to take young bees, and by upregulating the foraging gene pathway, we could create precocious foragers bees that were young chronologically, but they started to forage. So I should, I should have added that some of the stories that I will illustrate by just talking through um, the results, like I just did, and some I'll show you some data slides as well. So we found this intriguing parallel between flies and bees. Flies, they have a very interesting life, very complicated, but not much of a social life. So this was not socially regulated. It's not involved in the, in the fly's social activities uh, of any kind at all, which are quite limited. Whereas in the honeybee, it's involved in this intensely social uh, uh, matrix of growing up and paying attention to what needs to be done in the colony and maturing and moving from working in the hive to becoming a forager. So we have a solitary feeding gene involved in a social context. And then, and this will be important uh, towards the end of the talk, I mentioned this once already, we have a very interesting transposition of time scale. The fly story is a heritable story. From generation to generation, you can get sitters and rovers, which means it's on a very long time scale. This evolved. This is the evolutionary time scale. Whereas in bees, this is in real time. A bee is a nurse bee. She's got low levels of expression of this gene in her brain. Then she, as she gets older, the expression goes up, and it does play a causal role in her maturation to becoming a forager. So we have a time scale transposition. The same gene, kind of the same activity, feeding related, but in one is in a solitary context, and the other is in a social context. We found, after this gene, we found other genes as well. Um, we found genes uh, that have weird names, like Malvolio, that are also food feeding related in Drosophila. We found genes that have household names, genes involved in insulin signaling pathway that are involved in, as you know, feeding, nutrition, um, and known to be involved in those activities in fruit flies. And again, in a solitary context, in a bee, we see them involved in this social behavior in division of labor. So here's some data um, to support this. This is data on one particular insulin-like peptide, ILP1. This is work from Seth Amund, who was a PhD student in the neuroscience program. He's now a postdoc at the Institute for Systems Biology. On the vertical axis, you see the amount of RNA, so that's a measure of gene expression. We have the two behavioral groups, nurse and forager, and you can see foragers have significantly higher levels of gene expression for this particular gene in their brain. And then when we knock this gene out, uh, using, in this case, a pharmacological approach, we get a delay in the maturation. So the dotted line are the controls. The vertical axis shows the proportion of bees that are growing up and becoming foragers. And then you can see a delay in the onset of foraging, fewer bees becoming foragers in the treated group. Um, so we have this evidence from feeding-related genes in Drosophila. Another uh, evidence coming from some analyses that we've done on bees now, different species of bees, solitary bees, bees with intermediate levels of sociality, and then highly social bees, such as honeybees. When we look now at the genes and compare them, 
using very uh, sophisticated techniques to analyze the sequences themselves, it's possible to infer that there have been evolutionary changes during social evolution in many genes, and some of the key genes that show these so-called signatures of selection are metabolic genes. So we get this story over and over again, feeding related genes, nutrition, metabolism. Um, these are genes that are playing basic housekeeping roles and they have been put in play by social evolution to help uh, underlie these social phenotypes. So when we think about nutrition and we think about um, metabolism, we think about feeding, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to project them into sociality. Uh, we can show the data, but they're kind of nebulous in, in some ways. They also are quite removed from social phenotypes. So this next part of the talk, I think, pushes this into a little more focused way, um, and that is by looking at the role of a brain neurochemical also involved in feeding, but in this case, we've been able to show it's involved in the dance language of the honeybee. So let me introduce this part of the talk um, with something that might be familiar to you from Valentine's Day. We have no problem thinking about a concept um, like this, right? Um, well, okay, how about this? Will we, are bees also addicted to sweets? And then can we push it a little further? Can we say this? Are they addicted to altruism? So I'll show you some data that uh, allow me to at least speculate that that is the track that we are on. So what I'll tell you about is that uh, now projecting this from just a general context of feeding, nutrition, metabolism, to something um, that's reward related, we're able to, I think, push this concept further and talk about the molecular roots of altruism that lie in selfish behavior. So here's the setup. When a solitary insect finds good food, it eats more. Sounds pretty normal. When a honeybee finds good food, she really doesn't eat more. She certainly doesn't gather more. What she does, what does change in her behavior is she comes back to the hive and dances more. And this is not just a random behavior. This is a highly communicative behavior, which I'll show you in the next slide. But the point is, conceptually, the same brain chemical that makes solitary insects eat more makes honeybees dance more. So the same chemical that is fueling a selfish behavior of eating is now fueling an altruistic behavior. You find good food, you don't use it yourself, you tell others about it. So how do bees tell others about it? They use the dance language. This is the language of the honeybee that was discovered by Nobel laureate Carl von Frisch. Bees go out, and if they find food that's of sufficient quality, uh, they will come back to the hive, and with a series of ritualized movements that you see here, this bee is the one dancing, waggling her abdomen, going back and forth, making a figure eight. These other bees are the followers. They are somehow getting the information, and I use the word somehow advisedly. We still don't know how the communication takes place. We do know it does occur. Bees are able to communicate distance, direction, and the value of the food. Experiments with robots have shown that honeybees uh, have about a 50% communication efficiency. And Julia might kill me for saying this, but being married for over 30 years, 50% communication efficiency is pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good. So the bees are, are showing this extraordinary language here. I'll remind you the brain of the bee is the size of a grass seed. And so we've been able to implicate a neurochemical that's involved in it. So here are how we do the experiments. This is out at the bee lab. This is a large enclosure. Uh, we call it the bee dome. We train the bees to fly through a tunnel. Here's a close-up of the tunnel. Behind this blind here is a glass wall beehive known as an observation hive. Here is an observer. We train the bees to go through the tunnel to trick them to, so that they think they have flown further than they have. This is just an aside. The laboratory of Manyan Srinivasan in the University of Queensland showed that the way bees measure measure distance is by optic flow, the amount of information that flows past their eyes while they're flying. So this is how they tell. So how do we know that? If you train them to fly through a tunnel like this with a very dense checkerboard pattern, when they get to the end of that tunnel, they collect food, they come home, they go, wow, that was really a long distance. <laughs> they communicate that distance. Same bees, 
same hive, same food. You change the tunnel walls so it's a very sparse pattern. They go through it, they come back, and they go, ah, piece of cake, really short distance. So why was this important to us? This is important to us because many neurochemicals affect not only so-called higher functions like reward-related behavior, they also affect motor behavior. So in fact, the, the chemical that I'm about to lead up to is, is a cousin of dopamine. And as we know, dopamine in the vertebrate brain is sort of the brain's pleasure juice. And also, sadly, it's involved in motor diseases such as Parkinson's. Parkinson's is essentially a disease of the dopamine system. So if we're going to manipulate the dance language of the honeybee, so even though I showed you that picture, I think it's exquisitely choreographed. You might think it looks like a bee just running around. We wanted to make sure that the effects that we see would be very specific to the likelihood that the bee is going to dance, not some nonspecific, it's making them waggle in a nonspecific way. So we needed to have really good dis uh, dances. Bees will only do really good dances if they have to, if the distance is long enough. So we needed this tunnel, and, uh, and we were able to use it. So what we found is a chemical called octopamine, which in solitary insects makes insects eat more. We found that it makes the honeybee dance more. So here we have uh, the experiment. The y-axis, the vertical axis, is the likelihood of coming back to the hive and dancing. We have two different controls. We have bees that receive nothing at all, just the pure control. We have the octopamine, abbreviated OA. The octopamine is dissolved in a solvent, DMF. So we have a solvent control. And you can see that we can increase the likelihood that bees will dance about threefold with this chemical. So we, we right away were excited about this because when you think about dance, you think about the quality, that bees are only dancing when they find good food, and it's reasonable to kind of invoke the reward system. And as I have, it's reasonable to uh, say that, okay, then the molecular roots of altruism lie in the selfish behavior. The reward system has been manipulated so that the bees are feeling good when they are doing something for others rather than doing something for themselves. The only problem with that uh, whole interpretation is, uh, was that the reward system of insects was not very well characterized, and still to this day is nowhere near as well characterized as in humans. So in humans, we have a very good appreciation of the reward system, especially from fMRI or brain imaging studies. And we know that sensations and stimuli that are pleasurable to humans light up specific parts of the brain. These are the same parts of the brain, whether it's stamp collecting, if you're a stamp collector, or opera singing, if you're an opera singer, or sadly, drugs of abuse, if you're addicted, or chocolate, if you enjoy chocolate, and so forth. Same parts of the brain. We don't quite have, or certainly when we started this work, we didn't have those insights um, into, uh, into insects. So extending this idea um, to reward is uh, interesting and provocative, but we didn't really have all the, all the goods. So to take one small step in that direction, we took advantage of a little known entomological fact, which is that uh, a, a compound that you may have heard of a little more relative to octopamine called cocaine uh, is actually uh, a cousin to octopamine. It actually is involved in mediating octopamine's action. Um, it exists in nature as an insecticide. The coca plant produces this to kill insects. The way it kills insects is by affecting their nervous system. And um, just as I said, it affects their motor systems. But at a lower dose, we wondered whether it would be affecting the likelihood of dancing. And if you've just followed what I said, the experiment th therefore is fairly trivial. We are manipulating the octopamine system in a way that's predicted based on our results from octopamine. On the other hand, as anyone in the room who's done experiments know, stranger things have happened. So even if you are making a clear prediction, things could, could happen and give you surprises. We hypothesized that cocaine, because it potentiates the action of octopamine signaling in nature, uh, would make bees dance more, and we could substitute it instead of uh, octopamine. We had to, for some reason, fill out a lot more forms to do the experiment, <laughs> but we, we did all that, we persisted, and uh, we were able to show that, in fact, it beautifully mimics the effect of octopamine. These three bars, the pink and the two green ones, are the same data that you just saw. Now we have two other bars here, the orange and the yellow. The cocaine treatment showed the exact same effects as did the octopamine. And then when we use a chemical that blocks the octopamine effect, it also blocked the cocaine effect. 
suggesting that we're on the right track in interpreting these results. So by using cocaine, I think we've been able to push the reward concept a little bit forward. Uh, we've been engaging for the last couple of years in experiments to map the reward system of the honeybee. We're analyzing these results right now. This is the work of postdoc Matt McNeil. And we are slowly but surely developing um, a concept uh, that has to do with the questions that we pose here. Do bees dance more because cocaine makes them like their food more? Um, or because cocaine enhance, enhances their pleasure from dancing. The two words that are put in quotes are um, meant to be provocative, but to also say that we are addressing this molecularly using genomic tools. Um, this is the work of Matt McNeil and another postdoc in the lab, Karen Kapheim, and we are studying at a genomic level all of the genes' responses to different kinds of rewards, natural rewards of different kinds, artificial rewards, to see what the response is and whether we're able to make parallels between the response in the insect brain, honeybee brain, and vertebrate to be able to see, are we able to take the quotes off? And if so, which one, the first one or the second one? So we're not quite sure yet. In general, this work addresses some, some fundamental issues that go beyond the hive um, by looking at the lability the flexibility of the reward system, um, we may be able to derive new insights into uh, addiction, which is a disease of the brain's reward systems. Um, also, in a, from a different perspective, we're able to, to get some insights into the very delicate balance between cooperation and competition. This is something that we all have intuitive grasp of, that it's very, that the cooperation is a tenuous sort of social trait, requires nurturing, and uh, will easily flip into a more competitive sort of notion, as these bees here in the cubicles um, suggest. And so um, this is uh, something that, uh, that I think our, our work, as we get down to the molecular level, we may be able to uh, address these questions. But for now, we've already um, seen one very interesting example, which I'm about to share with you, to show just how complex um, the interplay between cooperation and competition can be. So this is the work of entomology graduate student Nick Nager, and we did this in collaboration with Andy Barron's lab at Macquarie University in Australia. Andy was a former postdoc uh, here. And so what Nick did, was look at worker honeybees that start laying eggs. So I have to give you a little more bee biology. I oversimplified at the introduction. I said workers, they don't reproduce, and they just do all the jobs in the hive. That's generally true. However, when a queen dies, and there are no suitable babies around to rear as a replacement queen, some of the worker bees actually develop their ovaries and become laying workers. They look like this. They back in to lay an egg. You hardly ever see this. It's a really, really rare trait, but it's possible to induce it experimentally. So we wanted to create a selfish worker honeybee in order to be able to contrast its gene expression profile in its brain with the usual altruistic uh, honeybee. So we created laying workers. And we got a big surprise. There are many graphs here. You're not going to be expected to read these. You're not going to be tested. The only point here is to see that there are no significant marks here. There are no differences between laying workers and regular altruistic worker bees in terms of the regular jobs in the hive. Bees with eggs in their ovaries are just as likely to be out foraging. We have no idea how they carry the extra weight and do that. Maybe that ought to be an Olympic event. So they're, they're out there foraging with eggs. They are just as likely to give up their lives in defense of the colony, uh, even though they have uh, several eggs in them. This is not predicted by theory. We were totally stunned. And so uh, we have a very interesting mystery that uh, needs to be solved. And Nick got out of one chapter on the thesis because he didn't do the comparison between the selfish and the non-selfish bees, because these are like part selfish and part non-selfish. So we don't know what to call them. But it's very, I think, interesting and illustrative example of the complexities between selfish behavior and altruistic behavior, their relationships between them. OK, so on to the second lesson, and that is that social behavior arises from a dynamic genome. Dynamic genome meaning a genome that's responsive to the social environment. I will illustrate this by again talking about our work on division of labor and then bring a new system in, um, and that is um, aggression. And then I'll finish up the talk by talking about how this lesson, how this insight has led to a new perspective on the nature-nurture problem and how we are using this new perspective to extend the work into the realm of human biology. 
So I remind you, uh, division of labor, the bees uh, work in the hive, and then they graduate and become foragers. Now, I didn't tell you the following, and that is that even though it sounds like this is a very fixed trait, and you would be forgiven if you thought that, because most people think insects are little robots, I'm here to tell you that's not the case. It's more complicated. Bees respond to changing colony conditions, and they can alter their process of behavioral maturation. They can speed up, slow down, or even reverse their process of behavioral maturation. If you, as I'll show you experiments in a moment, remove all the old bees from a colony, you will have then a group of very young bees chronologically. Some of them will speed up their maturation and become precocious foragers. Sort of like having 14-year-old drivers if you remove everyone on the road um, who's, who's driving. Um, scary thought. So, so precocious foragers. If you have a situation in a colony where you have very few young bees, some of the young bees, instead of growing up and becoming foragers, will be like Peter Pan. They'll stay in the hive, they'll never grow up, and they'll act as nurse bees, taking care of the babies. Despite the tick-tock of their chronological clock, they will then persist in an earlier, younger behavioral state. And then finally, if you have a colony that has young bees, nurses, acting in brood care, and old bees, foragers, and then you come in and remove every single one of the young bees, some of the foragers will actually revert, become young again, and take up young bee jobs. I don't make house calls, by the way, so this is just bee stuff. I have no secrets to the youth, the fountain of youth and humans. So uh, an incredibly flexible pattern, and it leads to the question of, well, how do they know what to do? I already told you one possible mechanism that doesn't work, which is the queen. Queen doesn't tell them what to do. So how do they know how to assess the labor market? And this is a really deep question in social organization because we tend to think, as the picture evokes, of centralized control. Uh, information collected centrally, processed centrally, flowing down some kind of a chain of command or chain of communication, giving everyone all the same information. In the bee colony, the lights are on but no one's home. There's no one in charge, but the bees respond as if they have global understanding of the colony, whereas we don't think they do. We think it's impossible that they would be able to do that. Instead, this is now where the honeybee colony comes into the picture as a complex system, where local information gives rise to global patterns. And so then it's our job to find some of those local rules that impart behavior at the global level. So what we found, to cut to the chase, and then I'll tell you how we found it, is that the process operates as a process of social inhibition. Old bees inhibit how fast the maturation of the young bees occurs. So if you have a colony, remove all the old bees, the young ones grow up prematurely because there's no source of inhibition. And then you can work through the various scenarios that I just said before to get all of the plasticity, all of the flexibility, using this mechanism. So old bees are inhibiting the maturation of young bees. How did we find this out? This goes back actually to our very first summer, summer of 1990. We had an experiment set up. This was work of Zachary Huang, who was a postdoc, my very first postdoc. He's now on the faculty at, at Michigan State University. And what we were going to do was take a glass wall hive, which is schematized here, and mark all the bees, and then watch them, and then have detailed records of the bees, and then see which ones become precocious foragers. We set up the colony with all young bees. Then we were going to identify the precocious foragers and then retrospectively go back to the records and find out uh, what were they doing when they were younger. Did they hang out in a certain part of the hive? Did they uh, engage in a certain behavior that may have predisposed them to becoming a precocious forager? We were going to let the process unfold and then retroactively go back and see if we could do some detective work and figure it out. So that was the plan, but um, Hollywood called and interrupted. Actually, it was Pittsburgh, it was a PBS film crew, but Hollywood sounds better. So film crew called and they said, we wanna come, we wanna um, film some of your research. I said, of course, I was a one-year-old assistant professor, uh, sounds great, please come, uh, you know, and uh, how high should I jump? And so um, <laughs> the, they came and they said, well, we need a glass wall observation hive for some of the work. I said, great, we've got one set up. So in this case, they really did act like Hollywood types. said, no, we don't like that, we want a bigger one. Uh, it needs to be bigger than that. And so uh, at the time, our very, <laughs> 
very first uh, B-Lab um, was uh, a modest facility, certainly totally functional. We had many great years there, but the space was limited. And uh, we had a situation where the only place that we could put this Hollywood hive was pretty close to our experimental hive. And the problem there is, even though bees are amazing and they're able to do all these sorts of uh, uh, navigation feats and social feats and so forth, if you put hives too close together, they will mix up. They will drift. Some of the bees will drift from one to the other. After all, they evolved in habitats where the hives are like a half a uh, kilometer located from each other. So they don't know from this urban living. And uh, there can be some confusion. So, uh, but you know, I mean, Hollywood called, so what can you do? So um, we filmed and everything was fine. And uh, I asked Zachary, um, after all this was over, I said, well, you know, how's the experiment going? And he said, well, actually, uh, not too well. Uh, the bees from the Hollywood hive drifted into the experimental hive, and uh, there was no precocious foraging. I said, oh, geez, you know, the pursuit of vanity and glory caused me to screw up my postdoc's very first experiment. I felt really badly about it. And then afterwards, I realized, hey, wait a minute, maybe we stumbled upon something. There are two ways to do experiments in biology. One is to let a process unfold naturally, try to understand what that process is, dissect it in exquisite detail, and so on and so forth. And the other approach is to break it to break something, break the process that you're trying to study, and then figure out how you broke it. That's, of course, the dominant paradigm in experimental biology, um, and that's the mutant approach, where you make, if you want to study learning and memory, you make a mutant fly that can't learn, and so on, and then figure out what did you do to that fly. So I wondered whether we accidentally broke precocious foraging, broke behavioral maturation, and, uh, and thereby discovered it. In other words, I wondered whether the bees that were entering in, of course, are older bees, foraging age, those are the ones that are out, maybe these bees just didn't screw up the hive, but maybe they inhibited precocious foraging. Now, of course, all this is in the realm of anecdote. You kick the tire on a car, your radio goes on, you know, that's not causality. So we went back to the lab to design experiments to test this anecdote, and we found, as you will surmise by the introduction, that that's exactly what happened. So we uh, conducted experiments with the world's smallest beehive, one bee here, no source of hypothesized inhibition. We would then expect that these bees, when placed into a colony after several days of isolation, would, become, would be more likely to become precocious foragers, and that's exactly what we found. So if you look at the distribution of foragers and non-foragers as a function of whether they were isolated in their youth or reared in a colony, you'll see that way more foragers, in this case precocious foragers, were from the isolated individuals. Then we also went on an experiment I won't show you to actually recreate the inhibitory experiment, but this time by design rather than by accident, and we would transplant groups of foragers from a typical colony into one of these small colonies, single cohort, age cohort colonies, and we got exactly the effects that we would predict. So we were able to then show that how fast a bee grows up is socially regulated by the age distribution in the colony. The more old bees in a colony, the slower the maturation. This then gave us a very interesting paradigm to explore the roles of gene expression. And this uh, slide here shows two experiments, so I'll take you through them, both very different styles of data. Um, and so let me take you through this. First, I want to lay this out for you. Um, each of these rows represents the expression pattern of a single gene. So you see altogether about 500 genes here that are depicted. Each of these rows is a gene. Each of the columns is an individual brain profile. There are 72 individual brain profiles here, and they belong to one of six different groups. We have the two typical groups, young nurse and old forager, and then we have the experimental groups that I was telling you about before. Young nurse, that's a typical group. Young forager, which is circled here, those are the precocious foragers that I've been talking about. And then we have the flip side. We have the, uh, the foragers, that are typical age, and then the old nurses, the Peter Pan bees that don't grow up. So what this is, is uh, the results of experiments monitoring now, not just one gene at a time, like we've been talking about before, but literally all the genes in the bee genome. 
This is a technique that was developed in the late 1990s. This was the first technique used to monitor all the genes. This was called a microarray. I'll show you a picture of a microarray shortly. Um, the field is so fast moving that it's now almost embarrassing to show microarray data. Now everyone sequences the RNAs as individual transcripts and then and then produces data on gene expression based on, on that. But this is a classic experiment um, that told us uh, a lot of really important information. So this then is a summary of the predominant patterns that you see of gene expression. And uh, this is the pattern where there were big differences in this set of genes. These were upregulated, greater than twofold is yellow, less than 0.5, so these are downregulated. The blue, the yellow is upregulated. So these genes were upregulated in nurses, downregulated in foragers, and then another set were reverse, upregulated in foragers, downregulated in nurses. So we see profound differences in the brain gene expression profile of a nurse bee and a forager. This, these are not genetic differences. Remember, every bee grows up and becomes a forager. These are maturational changes that occur real time, just like in the way I was talking about the foraging gene at the beginning of the talk. So we have these big differences. So the stage is set to see how strong an influence is the social environment on this process. And for that, we look, first of all, uh, and I'll highlight for tonight, the precocious foragers, YF. And you can see that the precocious forager brain gene expression profile basically is an, a, a mimic, a perfect mimic of the old foragers, the typical foragers, meaning that this gene expression pattern, and by inference, this gene expression pattern, is not a function of chronological aging where these genes change their expression by the biological clock, with apologies to Martha Gillette, these genes are changing their expression by the social environment. So if a bee is on track to become a precocious forager, its brain gene expression profile changes completely to resemble an old forager and the other patterns as well. So 40% of the genes in the bee brain show social regulation of expression a massive effect. I mentioned that there's social inhibition, and I said that uh, this process is old bees inhibiting the maturation of the young bees. Um, in addition to that, the queen also produces a pheromone known as QMP, seen right here. Um, queen pheromone also delays the onset of foraging, and uh, so this work was done by Charlie Whitfield, who was then a postdoc in the lab, and now he's on the faculty here at the University of Illinois in our own department of entomology. Christina Grosinger, who was also a postdoc at the same time, showed that this queen mandibular pheromone, QMP, also acts on brain gene expression in the predictable way. It delays the onset of foraging, um, and so what you see is that the genes that are activated by QMP are on the nurse list, are on the genes that are upregulated in nurse bees, and it inhibits genes that are upregulated in foragers. So it's one of the mechanisms to keep the bees down on the farm, affecting brain gene expression and downregulating foraging type genes, upregulating nurse type genes. So all in all, Charlie's and Christina's work was the first evidence, social regulation of brain gene expression on this massive scale. And then the final example has to do with aggression. This is my Patty Hearst slide right here, P Patty Hearst image. Oh, that's great. It's, I, when I show this in class, kids don't get it anymore. It makes me feel really old. So <laughs> thank you very much. So, uh, Social regulation of aggression also occurs. This is the entrance to a beehive. I want to point out, contrary to this picture, that bees are not aggressive. They don't attack, they defend their hive. You find a bee on a flower, she's not going to sting you unless you screw up and step on her or something like that. She's got nothing to defend. There's no defensive context. At the entrance, there is. There are hundreds of pounds of honey. There's the next generation of baby bees, and they are very vulnerable because they've concentrated all these resources in the environment, so you can be sure they have a very potent defensive system. 
They have specialized groups of individuals, guards, that patrol the entrance. They act like bouncers. They can detect who belongs in the hive and who doesn't belong in the hive, whether it's uh, something that looks nothing like a bee, like an ant or a frog, or whether it's a bee from another colony. They can also tell that as an intruder. They will release a social signal, an alarm chemical, an alarm pheromone that galvanizes the other bees to rush to the defense of the hive. The first group of bees that respond are bees that stay deep inside the hive. These are the soldier bees. They are the same age as foragers, but they either don't forage at all or forage much less, and they serve as the colony's first line of, of, uh, of attack after the colony has been provoked. They fly out, they search for the object that has been marked with the alarm chemical, and uh, they sting. So a very potent set of behavioral and social factors, and as we found, a uh, strong effect of social regulation on brain gene expression. In other words, part of this whole process is orchestrated by changes in gene expression. So I want to tell you about one experiment that demonstrates this social effect. Um, this is an experiment where we did cross-fostering, social engineering on a grand scale. We took bees from one colony and put them in another colony. We compared the relatively gentle bees, known as the European bees, from the bees that were brought from Africa to South America and spread throughout South America. Those are known as the African bees, or in the film industry, as killer bees. And this is an homage to May and her Fear Film Festival, which is coming up Saturday night. And uh, not showing this film, but it, I wouldn't put a pastor in another year to show something like this. So we did a grand a social engineering experiment on a grand scale. We took bees that belong in an African bee colony uh, and put them in a European bee colony and vice versa. And then using a microarray, this is a picture of a microarray, each one of these dots represents a gene and how brightly they shine represents how active the gene is. We found that there were massive differences in gene expression between African bees and European bees. And in addition to that, massive differences due to what hive environment, what home they were living in. 25% of the differences in gene activity were due to whether they were in an African bee colony or a European bee colony, regardless of their personal genetics. So a very strong effect of their environment. These experiments also led to other work in other species by colleagues here, as well as other locations, other universities, and the concept of the dynamic genome is really very strong. There's social regulation of brain gene expression in a variety of social contexts, in a variety of different species, vertebrates and invertebrates. And uh, we have an emerging picture of a new view of how to look at the relationship between genes and behavior. So here's the old view, which, by the way, is alive and well in many contexts, where there's a deterministic relationship between genes and behavior. There are variables uh, between individuals giving rise to some variable aspect of the brain at the molecular level, RNA, protein, um, leading to then variation in behavior. And uh, this model is the model, was the only model we had before genomics, and while it explains a lot in animal behavior, social scientists rejected it because it didn't capture the kind of flexibility and dynamic nature of behavior, which is what social scientists study. So we had a situation um, starting in the 60s and the 70s where social scientists rejected the biological model of behavior and kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater, rejected biology. And so disciplines today reflect that. You can get a degree in leading institutions in sociology or psychology and not have to know a lot about the neurobiology and behavior, uh, neurobiology and molecular aspects of behavior. And uh, I think this provides a new paradigm, the dynamic genome, for helping us to integrate um, the social sciences with the life sciences. And I'll tell you, in finishing up, of some of the new endeavors that we have going here. But first, let me finish the thought. So this is the old view. And it's been reasonably accepted for certain kinds of, of behavioral traits. We have no problem looking at the Manning family and saying, yep, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree and all that sort of stuff. But when we get to certain behaviors related to learning and memory, related to intelligence, um, related to personality, there's still 
a lot of unease about the relationship between genes and behavior using the traditional deterministic model because it paints a kind of a very sinister view of, uh, of the relationship. And of course, we, as I say, to, in the very first day of my genes and behavior class, um, the study of the genetics of behavior uh, is a field that has a legacy of shame to live down. And it is one of the fields of science that has done the most harm to humans, eugenics, the Nazis, Holocaust, all those sorts of things were done with scientifically inspired rationales to begin with. So we have a special responsibility, those of us that study this, to get it right. And I think we now have the tools, thanks to genomics, to, to begin to create a synthesis that does. So that looks like this. Social environment acts on the brain, causes changes in genome function that then leads to changes in brain and behavior. This is a dynamic process, as I tried to tell you. This is not set in stone. The environment plays profound effects on behavior, as anyone can tell you who studied it from a social science perspective. And we now have the beginnings of a molecular understanding, a biological concept to support that. So both are right. Both have their place, and they need to be integrated. And so what this does then is gives us a new perspective on nature and nurture because it's not genes versus the environment. It's not the environment acting in some way that's outside of bio biology. It's actually both acting on the genome. So nature is alive and well. There are hereditary effects on behavior. There's no question about that. This acts on the genome over the long time scale. Remember the sitters and rovers over the evolutionary time scale from generation to generation. There are changes that occur, evolutionary changes. The environment, though, also acts on the genome, as I've tried to tell you in the second part of the talk. Um, and that's nurture. This is acting over a shorter time scale. So the genome is central to both. And that's why I love this quote, the horns of a dilemma are usually on the same bull. So this dilemma of nature versus nurture all comes down to understanding it at different time scales, its effects on the genome. So I've been motivated to try to advance this perspective, bring this to the attention of social scientists. We started this in 2004. Um, now with further advances in the science, it's possible to actually take this perspective. So together with colleagues um, in Canada, Marla Sokolowski and Tom Boyce, a social psychologist, we organized a symposium to really explore the commonalities of biological embedding. How does social information get under the skin in animal models as well as in uh, human situations and, uh, and begin to pursue this. But I, I also want to mention that it's not just the concept that is motivating us. Um, it may also be that there are specific genes that, that span this scale here and that may be important in looking at the responsiveness of behavior in humans as well as the responsiveness of behavior uh, in animal models, including the honeybee. So extreme sociality is rare, as I told you, but social responsiveness is actually very common. I don't know if the marine flatworm had it, but otherwise, if you look at extant species, all animals respond to social stimuli, some for fleetingly small amounts of time in their life, like when they're mating, but, and others for longer periods of time. But social responsiveness is a trait, unlike division of labor, and things that I was speaking about before, social responsiveness is something that is very common across the animal world. So this has led a theme at the IGB, led by Professor Lisa Stubbs, of which I'm proud to be a member, um, and here's the group here, uh, has led this theme to explore this question, comparing uh, social responsiveness in mouse, in fish, and in honeybees. And so we are looking at two different kinds of social cues, the so response to social opportunities, response to social challenge, and the idea is to present the animals with these cues. Uh, they're having some effects on the brain that we are measuring at this point in time by measuring gene expression activity, um, and then looking at the differences in behavior. The group is rounded out, so the experimental biologists are myself, Lisa Stubbs, uh, who studies mouse, Allison Bell, who studies fish. The group is rounded out by three really talented and brilliant computational uh, biologists, computational scientists, Yoshi Ono from physics, Saurabh Sinha from computer science, and Jian Ma from bioengineering. And the group is rounded out by uh, Fei Wang from um, the Department of Cell and Developmental Biology, who studies cell biology. And so we hope to be able to understand these changes eventually at the cellular um, level. 
So that's one new initiative. And then the second one is the South Chicago Blacks Mothers Resiliency Project, which is headed by Professor Ruby Mendenhall, who's sitting in the front row tonight. Thanks for coming. And uh, this group is, is here. Uh, professors Sandra rodriguez Zaz and uh, Brent Roberts in the psychology department, Sandra in the animal sciences department, and then to post a postdoc and, and a graduate student here, Lauren Brennan and uh, Claire Richoff, um, rounding out this team. And so this addresses a, a really profound uh, societal problem, violence in urban areas, um, and asking the question of whether genomics can help uh, identify stresses and identify differences in the response of individuals to a highly stressful environment um, to be able to get a handle on that uh, biology. So in, in wrapping up, I want to make a point, since I've just been talking about uh, humans, that I am not for a second suggesting that bees are little humans or humans are big bees. Um, I, the differences are, are clear and very profound. I am instead advancing an idea that there may be genetic toolkits for social behavior, that is genes and molecular pathways, networks working together that uh, for some reason work very well in these social contexts and therefore if they work well they are conserved by evolution, they are preserved in evolution, they are used over and over again and so we're searching for common building blocks and, uh, and kind of a Lego model um, for understanding um, behavior, the mechanisms uh, of, of behavior. So in finishing up um, I want to just outline a couple of challenges that we have going forward. So I've just been talking about conserved genes and I want to make the point that there might be an ascertainment bias. Um, there may be some novel genes out there. There may be some genes that are specific to each species and genome projects routinely report the possibility of those. And so it's entirely possible that in addition to these highly conserved genes that do these well-known functions that are being reused and the whole point that I tried to develop tonight. In addition to that, there may be some novel genes that add some spice that are some key elements for honeybee social life, for human social life, and so on and so forth. They're much harder to study. We don't yet have the tools to study them really rigorously because we really only have um, uh, a few hundred species at the most of genomes sequenced so far. So we need thousands, millions, we will have them in a few years, and then the fun will really begin to be able to look at comparing conserved genes and novel genes. Second challenge we have is I mentioned that the genome is socially responsive. But let's take a look at that sentence for a second and think about that. Genes can't see, they can't hear, they can't taste. We are asking the question then of how can the genome, which resides inside the nucleus, inside the cell, inside the brain, inside the organism, how is it responding to a wink or a nod or a gunshot? How is that working? Um, what are the sensory mechanisms that are involved? How are they processed in the brain to actually trigger and orchestrate these exquisitely choreographed changes in gene expression? We are a long way from understanding this, and this is a segue to the third challenge, which is right now we have a real, really big problem in neuroscience, which is that we have two narratives that explain behavior. Both are really great narratives, full of rich detail, but they don't talk to each other, they don't communicate with each other at all. It's very much like the two blind men and the elephant, touching different parts of the elephant, describing it in great detail, and have no clue that they're looking at the same thing. We have a molecular pathway understanding of behavior, some of which I shared with you tonight. And it's a very rich field with many organisms providing a lot of information. We also have a very well-developed neural circuit perspective. Electrical activity changes, moment-to-moment uh, -moment changes in the electrical activity of neurons and giving rise to electrophysiology, neurophysiology. The molecular pathway is on a longer time scale, minutes to hours to days. Changes in neural circuits happen instantaneously. Both can explain behavior, and we need badly to understand how these two come and register. We have a lot of um, uh, ideas on campus. The Obama's Brain Initiative led the campus to come together under the leadership of Neil Cohen, the director of the neuroscience program, and we are planning um, uh, efforts to try to go after some of this new money to be able to map the neural circuits and be able to try to connect them to the molecular pathways. 
Then the final challenge is that this new field of genomics has really burst on the scene, and the amount of data that you can collect in genomics is unparalleled relative to other fields. And it now outstrips our ability to be able to collect data on the traits that we're interested in. So in my case, behavior. So we can get more information on gene expression more quickly than we can on behavior. So many labs, including my own, are trying to redress, address that situation by do it using uh, automated techniques, modern technology to automate. And I just want to give you a teaser as we finish up of some of our um, offerings that we're developing here. This is the work of Paul Tenzar, who is a citizen scientist in the lab. I have to give a shout out to my friends John and Benita Katz and Ellen Bogan. Paul is a, a neighbor, a hobby beekeeper, a ret retired computer entrepreneur. Um, John and Benita came to me and said, Paul would love to work in your lab. Do you have anything for him? Um, he knows computers very really well. He's an engineer. and so. I asked him if he could design an RFID system to track bees automatically, and he did that. He works incredibly hard, and uh, although he takes off for these snorkeling trips to Belize, and I have to tell my students, you can't do that. He's earned it already. Um, <laughs> but aside from that problem, it's been, it's been great. We have these very interesting multi-generational teams. Paul's worked closely with uh, former graduate student Claudia Lutz to develop this technique. These are the RFID tags here. Here is the device. Um, the bees pass through. We've basically traded sunscreen for RFID tags, and we now have automated tracking of bees going in and out of the hive. And Paul made a discovery that has never before been made. We've just submitted a paper with Paul as the first author that 10% uh, of the foragers do 50% of the work. No one ever knew that before. Honeybees are among the most well-studied animals on the planet, and no one ever knew of this uh, disparity um, here. We, uh, we learned, knew about it last year. We tried to shop it to the Romney campaign, but they, didn't, they wouldn't have it. And so so we, we went on from there. And then finally, um, we're also building social networks in the beehive. This is the work of graduate student Tim Gernot. He's actually a graduate student in the University of Leipzig, and he spends six months uh, in computer science, and he spends six months of every year in my lab. Um, he's not using uh, RFID tags. He is using barcodes. He's uh, designed these barcodes. He's designed the software to read the barcodes. Every one of the bees has a barcode, and then he um, has designed machine learning uh, paradigms uh, with uh, an automated camera, takes a picture every second, 24-7, around the clock. We have the first terabyte sized data sets for bees. And then he's devising software to be able to, um, to identify social interactions. He's working closely with members of Nigel Goldenfeld's lab and Harry Dankowitz's lab, both very quantitatively oriented um, laboratories. And um, this is some preliminary results of the very first social social network in a hive based on touching and contacting each other. And we have some intriguing observations. First of all, the queen has, is one of the most well-connected individuals. That's sort of a ground truth. That's what we would expect. What we expect, some of the workers actually approach the queen and contact her, um, which gives us confidence when we see striking differences like this. We've got a bee with uh, rivals the queen in the number of social uh, interactions that she had during her first week in life. And then we have a bee here with three interactions. We know nothing of the functional consequences. We don't know if this bee is gathering all this information and synthesizing it and, and then is able to make the right behavioral um, decisions, or if this bee is, you know, the equivalent of so busy checking her Facebook page that, you know, she's worthless to the hive. And we, we don't know. And likewise, we don't know about this bee, whether it's just out of it, it's not well connected in the network, or whether it's a deep thinker and it's, you know, got the next great thought that's going to propel honeybees forward. We don't know. We can, we can study that, though, because we can document these differences and then ask behavioral questions. Um, so we're very excited about these methods and then connecting them up with the genomic methods to link the molecular understanding with the behavioral understanding. So in closing, I've tried to share with you two lessons that we've learned so far, that uh, genes that influence solitary behavior, social behavior have their evolutionary roots in solitary behavior. And secondly, that social behavior arises from a dynamic genome. This squarely puts the focus on 
gene regulation on the when, where, and how questions of genes. And so we're going to be relying ever more on studies of gene regulations and our colleagues in systems biology and in computational biology to understand the complex networks that orchestrate genes, embeds them in networks, and gives rise to the amazing behavior that we see in honeybees. I want to close by acknowledging the people whose work I uh, I um, spoke about. I'm not going to go through all these names. I think I managed to mention everyone I wanted to, but I do want to give a couple of special shout outs tonight because it's rare that we um, scientists get a chance to speak in front of our friends in our local environment. We're busy traveling all over the place. And uh, I would have responded quicker, Leon, if you told me what the purpose was, uh, just for the record. Um, <laughs> But I want to give a couple of shout outs. So um, uh, the lab over the 25 years that has existed has really benefited from very strong technical support. Uh, Karen Pruitt, who was our B lab manager for many years. Tom Newman, who was our molecular uh, lab manager for many years. They both retired. They've been replaced by two fantastic individuals, Charlie Nye, doing a great job at the B lab, and Amy Ahmed Cash, who's uh, involved in our, our um, molecular lab and, and organizing it and managing it, and a special Shout out to Edwin Hadley, who's been a graphic artist, who's produced uh, slides for me for probably 15 years, and who I've never been able to take along with me on a business trip. Um, and so it's a pleasure to be able to say thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the slides that you see and that everyone has um, looked at tonight, and they were the product of, of his work. And then the last shout out, and he's going to hate me for doing it, is uh, our former department head, Stanley Friedman, who made a special effort to come here tonight. And uh, I think it's a measure of the esteem and respect that so many of us still have for Stanley, that we're still in touch with him regularly uh, over 20 years since he has uh, retired. Stanley is the one that hired me 25 years ago. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to take your questions. There's a microphone coming around. If you want to take a shot at shouting, you can. I'll, I'll try shouting. Okay. And then if the microphone comes, then you can take it from there. I was wondering whether I misunderstood, but uh, I was wondering whether what you're suggesting here suggests that Lamarck wasn't a complete idiot. You are exactly right. If Lamarck, Lamarck had a really good idea, but he picked a terrible example. So giraffe, legs ain't, uh, giraffe neck ain't going to happen the way he uh, uh, surmised, but the idea of the environment causing changes and then etching those in some still not completely understood way into the biological fabric is, in fact, uh, something that's happened. But it it's going to be trait dependent, and gira giraffe length, uh, necks aren't going to lengthen by a, a mechanism that he suggested. Uh, yeah, I haven't gotten around to telling them yet about that. Yeah. <laughs> Down here? Let, let's wait for the, the microphone. Uh, when bee workers adjust their maturation process, does that affect their lifespan? Do it does. That's a great question, yes. So foraging wears you out. If you work in the hive, you can live for a long time. So bees that are born in the fall, before the winter, uh, have very little foraging. They can survive all winter, so they can live for months and months. Okay. But once you start foraging, um, the clock starts ticking internally, and also you are really susceptible to uh, outside risks. I can't remember the name of the dopamine equivalent, and it's the octo... Octopamine? Octopamine. Mm -hmm. So is the idea in the 10% of the bees that are doing 50% of the work, maybe that they have more octopamine receptors or they're producing more, they're, they're getting a better feeling for doing that than the other ones? It's a great idea. We haven't put the two studies together. So Paul's discovery was just made, and we've substantiated it in Nigel's group with modeling, and now comes the time to really think about what's the biological basis of that uh, uh, striking difference in behavior. We just thought foragers you know, all pretty much work about the same before. So now that's a great, great suggestion that, to follow up on.
you spoke about the great complexity of uh, the distance between DNA, RNA, proteins to behavior. How do you suggest that we best treat that? And also you mentioned the importance of uh, the scientists, the natural scientists and social scientists working together. And many of the social scientists are really looking at the behavioral change and what's happening in society. I'm, and I'm so impressed with the teams that you mentioned. I would just love to learn a little bit more in, about how do we address this complexity in terms of getting from the science to action mm -hmm. on the ground? Yeah, those are, those are two great questions. And they have very different kinds of answers. Um, the first one, how do we bridge the gap from the molecular understanding to the neural circuit understanding um, is a, uh, uh, a straightforward sort of scientific question. I can give you a kind of a straightforward uh, scientific answer. And that is that uh, we need to find experimental models that are tractable in both of those contexts where we can study changes in the electrical activity of neurons in circuits that are somewhat understood and where we can, un and where we can also study the molecular changes and start to uh, put them together um, in a very explicit way. The second question, as you know, we struggle with this. You're in the group as well. And uh, we're trying to gain some traction on this. And I think uh, Ruby is pioneering this work with, uh, with her system, where you start with a established social science paradigm where you know a lot about it. And then you attempt to layer in the genomics. And so Ruby has a hypothesis that some of the genomic changes associated with stress um, and immune function are going to be manifest in individuals that report feeling high levels. So that may sound like a small step, but it's a huge step to be able to ask, is the biology, that we the biology of stress that we understand today, does it extend to this to this paradigm. So we have this, this group that addresses this question um, that includes biologists, includes social scientists, and, uh, and we're trying to integrate it. Martha. So Jean, I may be a biologist, but much of this is still new to me. It's fascinating that the switch between uh, solitary, living a solitary life and a communal life is based on the feeding genes. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering whether those bees that live deep in the colony and are, are not aging very fast, right, uh, versus the ones that are roaming around, what is the switch there and, and why do they live shorter once they start roaming? Is, it, is their metabolic rate changed or is there something about living the fast life causes the aging genes to be turned on? What's your interpretation? Yeah, th those are great questions. When a, a bee uh, works in the hive compared to then becoming a forager, there are many changes that occur. Uh, changes in brain structure, changes in brain chemistry, and yes, changes in metabolic activity. The metabolic changes are, are really intriguing because at the whole body level, the bee becomes more metabolically active, as you might think, to support a foraging machine, but the brain becomes, has a, has a profound metabolic shift and is less metabolically active in terms of the principal method of generating energy, which is the oxidative phosphorylation system. So postdoc in the lab, Claire Richoff is, is studying this and how this is involved with aggressive behavior, because this is where we see the biggest change. Aggressive bees, bees that are aroused, have low levels of brain metabolic activity, and it seems very counterintuitive and it's opposite to the whole body levels. So we are trying to understand that. So I can just say that there are huge differences and we're describing them, we don't understand them yet. Yeah, sorry. So it seems to me that essentially the case you're making is that society is kind of an emergent behavior coming out of individual uh, behaviors, interactions amongst a mass of, you know, individuals in an organism. So there's quite a bit of, you know, emergent behavior study in say morphology and morphogenesis where there's predictable patterns that would emerge based on, you know, that you can test by tweaking individual genes. So do you think something similar can come say based on the social network kind of thing that we're showing in the end where you could come up with a pattern of interaction that might ar arise from individual gene changes and would that be testable eventually? Yeah, that's a really brilliant question and that is the implication of the work. The missing piece though here is, and this is what the last work gets at, how uniform are all the components? 
many of the models of complexity that you are alluding to are rather anonymous about the individuals or, or treat them as, as individual agents. And that is pretty much what we thought the honeybee situation was. But Paul's work and Tim's work um, suggest that there may be even more complexity. There may be, you know, hub genes, excuse me, not genes, hub bees that are really key parts of the network. And so um, after we get more of these kind of data, we would like to do experiments where we remove certain bees that seem to have large amounts of social interaction. And does that, does the network fall apart or what? One hint that we have about the resiliency is I said this 10% perform 50%. So the last experiment that Paul and Claudia did before we submitted the paper is they removed those 10%. What do you think happened? Yes. Other bees took over this elite job that we were saying, wow, these 10%, they're really special. You remove them, other bees took up that job. And we know from their behavioral records that they were very low key prior to that removal. So they have the capacity for that elite level, but it doesn't happen unless the societal uh, needs manifest um, themselves. How, how does our understanding or your understanding of the dynamic genome uh, shed some light on the phenomenon of colony collapse disorder? So how does the uh, phenomenon of the dynamic genome shed light on colony collapse disorder? Well, there's relatively little light on colony collapse disorder in general, but um, one possibility, and this is just speculation, is that part of the colony collapse disorder um, stems from an imbalance in the demography of the colony, a, a loss of foragers leading to some of the bees growing up too quickly and then they're not capable of navigating as well if they've been forced to grow up too quickly. And then that may lead to imbalances that could have an autocatalytic effect. This is speculative, so I want to be very clear about that. But it's based on the fact that when the going gets tough, the tough go foraging. So any stressor that's been studied in honeybees, one effect of that is to lead to premature maturation. Evolutionarily, we think that makes sense because in the primitive insect societies from which honeybees evolved, there were probably uh, behavioral c competitive interactions and the individuals that lost those interactions because they were a little too small or they had a bad day or they had a parasite infection, they would be the ones going out foraging and bringing back food for the individuals that would be staying home, growing fat and happy and developing their ovaries to lay eggs. So we know that stress leads to uh, early foraging, and we know that colony collapse disorder involves a variety of stressors, but, and there are computer models that support the argument that I just made, but whether it actually happens, um, we don't know. Yes, okay. yeah, sorry. How do you see the links between the kind of work you reported tonight and the insights and the announcements earlier this week regarding I don't know if it's the other end of genomic research, but it had to do with um, the studied genome in human history, being able to trace human migrations, mm -hmm. um, percentage of Neanderthal, all of that. I mean, how, how do you link those two bodies of research or, you know, how do you see that? Right. So there was only one line, two lines in my talk that link it. One was the genome as a history book. And the other was a very quick mention that some genes involved in metabolism show signs of selection. They show signs that evolution has acted upon them and changed their sequence. So it's that kind of approach where you line up the sequences of many different organisms. In the case of the work you're referring to, uh, different humans from different parts of the world and some ancient human genomes. And you line them up and you look for very small changes in just one single spot on the genome and you look for them using computer programs that allow you to say that those changes reflect evolutionary changes. And from that and a knowledge of the genome as a history book and some of the rules that go into that, you can infer the age of certain populations and some of their history. Um, in, in the hive, does it matter who dad is? And 
I guess, why is there one queen but mm -hmm. a few drones? <laughs> It, it matters very much who dad is. And in fact, um, queens mate with up to 20 different males. And so the colony is kind of a postmodern assemblage. So you have a set of individuals that share two parents coexisting with other sets that share a different father but the same mother. And there are genetic, in this case traditional, genetic, heritable differences in behavioral proclivities uh, as a result. They don't dominate the landscape. They are influences. So if you're going to be a scout, if you're going to be a soldier, uh, if you're going to be a guard bee, uh, who your daddy was has some influence on that in, in a measurable way, but not a dominant way. As to the question of why the queen mates multiply, there are a number of theories there, because mating is a very risky behavior in general for all species. Um, it's a time when you're occupied with something else, and so you are less vigilant. You're less able to devote time to watching the horizon for a predator. You certainly don't have the time to eat. You're doing something else. So it's a risky behavior, and uh, theory would predict that you would minimize the time that you're engaged in that. So the mystery in honeybees is, is quite interesting because the amount of sperm that a queen can get from a single male is enough to set her up for life. Insects, and honeybees have this, have an organ to store sperm. They can store sperm at room temperature uh, for years. Um, sperm banks would love to know the secrets uh, for that. So a queen can store sperm um, from one male. It's enough for her two million. She'll lay up to two million eggs in her one to two year life. She can get enough uh, from sperm from a single male. So why does she mate multiply? There are different theories. One theory is that genetic diversity is good in the hive uh, to minimize pathogen spread. So you have a pathogen, um, what might knock out one mating, the progeny of one mating, but another mating progeny will be resistant. So that's one possibility. Another possibility, and there's good evidence for this, another possibility is that a more di genetically diverse workforce performs more efficiently because some will be more likely to do a particular job. They'll jump on that job first, they'll get it done, and then make it less likely that others need to do that. And you have a little bit of genetic specialization, and there's good evidence for that. And so it looks like a trait as striking as multiple mating may actually have been fueled in social evolution and, and natural selection um, by multiple imperatives. Yes, uh huh. Thank you for your lecture. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment, uh, perhaps this is a broad question, so briefly, um, on how or to what degree commercial beekeeping or the intensification of commercial beekeeping since the mid 19th century has uh, altered the sociality of honeybees and its biology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a very intriguing question. Uh, apiculture, beekeeping has gotten very intense in some parts of the of the world. Um, I'd say we see no evidence for changes in social organization at all. Um, the basic patterns that are observed that I talked about today, one sees in uh, commercial hives. What we do see, though, is uh, certainly they are exposed to an array of environmental insults like they never before have been. And these sublethal, these, some, some of these effects are lethal, some of them are sublethal, but they're having insidious effects uh, on, on behavior, certainly on their longevity and how robust they are. And so while we've not yet documented any effects on social organization, it's not out of the realm of possibility that there are some subtle effects um, that are occurring, but uh, we don't have any information on that.